people who love the Word of God and are learning to teach it based on a relationship with God. So they're, they're getting up here and they're sharing their hearts, not just what they've learned from a book, right? They're connecting the dots. They're connecting the dots, and that's all I'm doing too. I'm just here learning right alongside of you all, okay? All right, I might be five minutes ahead of you, okay? But that's all I have to be, right? <laughs> I don't even have to be ahead of you. Um, so I want to ask a question before I open this up in prayer. I'm going to dismiss our kids. Um, so kids, they're like, yes. All right, so all the kids, uh, fifth grade and down, if they're not already back, you go ahead and meet your leaders here in the back. And we're going to pray for you as you go and your teachers, especially your, no, I'm just going to pray for all of the folks that are back there, right? And this is why we remember that when we're done, that we want to make sure that we get back and, and get there and get them. Just to really appreciate our leaders that are willing to pour into these little ones. They don't just teach them the Word of God. They show them the Word of God through the way that they, they, they uh, lead them. And so that's awesome. Here's a question I want to ask you today. What do you want said at your funeral about you? What do you want said about you at your funeral? It's a little sobering question, and if you're under 30, you probably haven't even thought about death much. <laughs> Um, but you probably should, because there's no guarantee, right, that you're going to live a long, healthy life. We were um, new in the town of Wilson. We'd been, uh, I was just out of, I was still in seminary, in fact, and I was overlapping. I started my first youth pastor job in Wilson, North Carolina, and we had some good friends that were still in seminary, and they had come over for dinner. It was about a 30, 45-minute drive over on 264, and uh, on their way back that night, about 9 o'clock, it had just happened, they saw a, a SUV roll. And so Bobby, who, who was in seminary with me, he uh, is also a registered nurse. He pulled off the road and he ran over to see if he could help because there were no emergency vehicles there yet. It was four teenagers, and uh, one of them didn't make it. Okay, so you, you never know, and I don't want to, you know, write Johnny Raincloud here. I don't, I don't, that's not my point, my, but... But at the same time, my point is to sober you a bit. It's to make you think and remember and realize that life is short, no matter how long you get it. Life is short and precious, okay? And we need to think about the end game. What, how do we want it to end for us? In other words, when people talk about you and how you lived, what are they going to say? What does that look like? And then when you look at your life now, are you on a trajectory that puts you there? Because I'm assuming you're going to pick something that's good. In fact, you're going to pick something that really communicates what you value. Now, it may be something very shallow, but it's still something you value. Are you on a trajectory to get there? But then I would challenge you a next level is, is this somewhere that you believe God would be pleased for you to be? And are you on a trajectory for that? Now, Paul is writing this letter to Titus because he's, trying, he's left Titus in charge. <laughs> it's like, Titus, you've got to get this island ship shape. It's not Gilligan's Island, but it's pretty close. It's bad. <laughs> okay, it's Crete. And we've got um, folks that are on, on the far end of the scale of wicked and undisciplined and unruly and all of the rest. But the gospel has landed on the shores. Churches have been planted. Paul and Titus work together on that. But, but Paul, he's got to go. God's always sending Paul somewhere else. And so he writes a letter so that he can make sure that Titus has something to work with. And at the end of the day, that letter basically is boiled down to good doctrine leads to good behavior. Good doctrine leads to good living, fruitful living, living a life that at the end of the day, when people talk about it, they're talking about you, but they're really talking about the Lord in the context of your life. And isn't that what we really want? At my funeral, you better be talking a lot about Jesus. You better be celebrating Jesus. And yeah, you're going to have some good stories. Um, and you, if you don't, you're going to have to make some up for me. Okay, help me out a little bit, all right? But make Jesus look good, okay? Because he is. But it comes through the picture of people living good lives that happen because of belief in good truth that comes from a good God. Okay? Does that sound like a good plan? Can we do that? All right, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we want to shine a spotlight on you because you are the star. There is no other. 
You're the one we want to lift up and be like. You are the face of grace. And you leave us to be the face of grace in your wake as you go and sit to the right hand of the Father, empowering us through the beautiful Holy Spirit to do just that. Well, God, we need you. We need your help. We need you so badly. And, and Titus understood that. Paul understood that. And they're going to give us some, some help on how to do this, why to do this. And so, God, I just pray that your word would find fertile soil in the hearts of people here today, whether they're listening in or sitting in, and that the seed would grow and mature and bear fruit that will last. Because that's what you chose us to do. You told us, I didn't, you didn't choose me, but I appointed you. I chose you to go and to bear fruit that will last. That's why you picked us. Not because we're good at it, but because you know we're not good at it. And you want to shine and show your glory through showing people what God can do with somebody who can't do it apart from your grace. We need it. We ask for it. And we pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are working through the book of Titus. If you haven't heard of it, um, it's, it's in the New Testament right after the Timothys, First and Second Timothy. They're, it's one of the, uh, what's called a pastoral epistle, which means it's, a, it's an epistle or a formal letter written to preacher guys. But it applies to anyone in the church, okay? Um, and men and women, children, uh, it doesn't matter. It, it applies, and it's really great help in helping us know how do you do church, how do you lead church, how should leaders lead and feed the flock, lead, feed, and protect the flock. So um, we're going to start in verse 1, and the title of today's message is really the bottom line of the message, and that is this, that we are saved to be and do good. We are saved to be good, and we are saved to do good, but we need to make sure we get those in the right order, okay? We don't, we're not going to do good so that we can be saved and be good, okay? And we're not um, doing good because we're good people apart from God, and you'll see that Paul is going to unpack that. We're saved to be good and do good by the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's see how Paul says it. He'll say it much better than I did. All right, so it starts off with the job that every preacher should have. Every pastor should have this job. It's to remind people... <laughs> right? To remind all of us of what's true and good about God and how we are to live out that, that goodness, okay? And now he's going to start with seven do's and don'ts, if you will. But remember, this is coming from a place he's already explained in depth why. And this is the way Paul likes to write his letters. He kind of gives the foundational theology and doctrine, and then he gives you the practical application that flows from this. Because if you don't believe or understand the foundational truths, then you're going to do the right application with the wrong heart. And that's called all kinds of terrible isms, right? It always frustrates me a little bit when I hear somebody say on TV or somewhere, they'll go, all religions are basically the same. Because <laughs> I want to go, no, I want to scream at them and say, no, 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 they're all the same except for one. Christianity is, and I don't even, and even Christianity, you have to have to kind of sort out the, the wannabes from the real thing. The scriptural truth that we get in God's word is this. You can't gain any good you can't earn God's favor. It is a gift, okay? We don't do good to get his favor. We have his favor, which is why we want to do good and are able to do good, okay? And so Christianity is the only one where everything that needs to happen to get you in a right relationship with God has been done short of you receiving it. Every other religion, you're working and, and working and worrying, did I get it yet? Did I get it yet? And you die never knowing for sure, do I have it? And if you're not sure, because you've tried and walked down that path, that's not a good place to be. You want to know that you know that you know. These things, John writes, these things have been written that you may know that you have eternal life. It's something you can be certain about, and it's something you shouldn't scratch your head and wonder about. Okay? If you're scratching your head and wondering, that's a good place to be, because then maybe your heart is humble and receptive to it. But, um, but don't leave it there deal with it. So he starts off out of these seven things. The very first one is really tough for a lot of people today. 
Doesn't matter how you feel about the election. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities. Can we just move on to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is, say it with me, good. To slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, in all ways to be gentle toward everyone. Doesn't sound like American politics, does it? <laughs> Doesn't sound like what he was dealing with on the island of Crete or in the Roman Empire either. It's not new what we're dealing with, it's just more sophisticated. At one time, we too were foolish. Now, Paul is speaking to Titus, so he's saying, you and me, remember, we were fools, <laughs> and not fools for Christ. We were just plain fools. We were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved to our, all kinds of passions and pleasures. Uh, we lived in malice and envy. Malice is when you have evil intent. You do something just out of raw evil intent. Malice and envy being hated and hating one another. So Paul's reminding T Titus, don't forget where you came from. Don't forget what your life was like before the grace of God entered. But when you embrace the grace of God, it changes everything. And if it hasn't changed everything, if it's not working in every crevice of your life, maybe you're stiff-arming God a little bit. And you need to be careful of that. Now, then he says, but when... But when? I love this. This is where he turns and he starts to tell us, here's the good news in contrast to the bad news that he just described. This is what we were like. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things that we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us. And he, so he just tells us what, how. Here's how. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Why? So that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying, and I want you to stress these things. Why? So that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is, say it with me, good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Okay, so uh, these first seven things, just most of these are very straight. Subject to rulers and authorities, I want to spend a little are. Every one of us, just say the word election or president. You voted for, or if you voted at all. Because we're watching this madness and we're going, I just want to throw something. So hopefully your TV is still working. Let me flip to uh, 1 Peter, um, turn to the right, get past uh, Hebrews, and 1 Peter chapter 2. I just want to read some of these verses to you. Now, Peter is writing to the church also. He's writing to Christians in Rome, the Roman Empire. And again, Christians, you need to realize that the context is that Christians are being persecuted. Really, most of the first 200 years, the church, Christians, are being persecuted for what they believe. It gets, there's ebbs and flows to it. There are times when it was worse than others, depending on who was the emperor and how nuts he was and how much he thought he was divine and, or, or not. Um, but Christians were an easy target, and he didn't mind swinging. First, first Peter 2, um, starting in verse 9, I'm going to read through 17. Now, what I want you to listen for is who are you in Christ? Who am I in Christ? Think identity and how I live as a result of that identity, okay? Starting in verse 9, Peter writes, But you, Christians, followers of Christ, you are a chosen people. Okay, that means God picked you. I'll tell my kickball story another time. I love that. A royal priesthood, that means you're from a royal family. You're part of a royal family and you have religious duties, a holy nation set apart, God's special possession, which means God treasures you personally and collectively. Here's why. That you may declare the praises of him. You guys did a great job singing today. I just want you to know that. It was beautiful. You were praising God through your, and it sounded like you weren't just singing to me, okay? And I'm sure some of us were. I mean, I've been there. But man, that's why he does this. He's chosen us so that we can praise him, not just for three songs on a weekend, 
right? In all that we do, but that's another sermon for another time, that we may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God, united, one body, many members. Once you have not received mercy, but now you have received mercy, which we'll see back in Titus is God's motive for saving us in the first place. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Dear friends, I urge you, okay, so we're, Peter's like, he's really like, come on now, I really need you to do this. I urge you, and then look what he calls them. He calls us foreigners and exiles. If I'm a foreigner in this country, I'm an, I don't know if I should say illegal immigrant or not. But you see what I'm saying? You don't quite belong, do you? If you don't have your green card or your papers, you don't really belong yet. Doesn't mean you can't. Doesn't mean that that's not a good thing. Not opposed to that. But my point is that in this world, we kind of want to think we really belong here and that as citizens of this country or whatever country you're, you're living in right now, there's a sense of that patriotism and this is who I am. And this is, but that's, that identity is like this compared to the skyscraper of our identity in Christ. It's not even close. But I don't know, I get kind of, sometimes I can get pretty proud to be an American you know, I can want to paint my Bible red, white, and blue and wave it on, you know, and, 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 and sometimes even go so far that I go too far. And then I get all upset when things don't go the way I want them to go in my country because my country's not being my country like I've read in history. And so I can get out of, and, and those are good things. We've come from a good place. God has had his hand on this nation, maybe like no other apart from Israel but we're still not truly eternal citizens of this country. This country will not last. Only the kingdom of God will last forever. And that's where we're citizens, okay? And so he's saying, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your own soul. So why would we do that? And yet he's exhorting them because we all have the temptation to let that happen. And you know how that's happening in your life right now, if it's happening. Verse 12, live such, say it with me, good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. That means that they can disagree with you politically or any other reason, but still look at you and go, yeah, but <laughs> those people, they know they live good lives. Verse 13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. Does that include HOAs? I'm sorry, I digress. <laughs> to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority, because he sometimes thought he was, or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will. You ever want to know what God's will is? Here's one example. For it is God's will that by doing, say it with me, good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. Wouldn't that be nice? Live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. And then it's going to sound like he contradicts himself. You're going to love this line, right? Live as God's slaves. I wish I could preach on that for a while. Let me just remind you of the illustration I, I did a couple of weeks ago with the violin string that is free. You can wiggle the string all around, but it's not free to sing until you bind it to the violin. And then it's... I'll say there. But... Um, uh, respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Okay, so in our country, honor the, the president, honor the Supreme Court justice, honor the congressman or woman, on, on all the way down, right? The governor, the mayor, PTA president, all, right? Honor those in authority, okay? Back to Titus. Now, I spent a lot of time there at the expense of some other things because that's just where I feel like we're, we're probably struggling a little bit. I know I am. And yet, I just need to remember who I am and who I'm not, and when I remember that, and if I have trouble with that, then I want you to go back to our root to fruit, okay? Who is God? What has he done? Who am I? 
what do I do? Who is God? What has he done? Okay, in the Old Testament, over and over and over, God would say, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery, brought you out of Egypt. So, okay, there's, there's the scriptural background for who is God, what has he done? And then in light of that, when I trust him, who am I? And my identity ratchets up quite a bit. I go from enemy of God to child of God, ambassador of Christ, minister of reconciliation, holy nation, royal priest, chosen person, special treasure, possession, on and on and on, right? Scripture has like 75 identities of who we are in Christ. We've got to start believing that those things are true for us, but most importantly, because they tell us what it is we're supposed to do. What do we really get to do as followers of Christ? And I would say, among other things, just in general, how about do good things? (laughs) How about do good works? Be fruitful in your faith. All right, so uh, let's go back and let's just, let me, let me catch us up to where I, I want to camp the rest of the time. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is, say it with me, good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always be gentle toward everyone. At one time, we too, Paul says to Titus, we were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. Okay, you've heard me talk about the different uh, idols. The base idols, Timothy Keller uses this. He says that there's three, basically three kinds of idols and all the, all the idols we think about fall under these three categories, okay? Ambition, approval, and appetites. Ambition is like control or power. And God has given us the ability to control and have power so that we can influence things for good. But taken to an extreme, it can become a God instead of God, okay? Um, uh, ap- uh, approval would be, um, it's good that to, to want to be liked. It's good that you care what other people think to an extent. But if we take that too far, okay, then what happens is that becomes more important than anything. We worship that. So think about how you handle social media. Is it how much of that am I really trying to paint a picture of someone who I'm not, but who I want to be? When I, um, the way I carry myself at work, is it because I, I want to do a good job or is it because I want people to like me? Do you make decisions in your life that you let it's like the tail wagging the dog because you're worried so much about what someone else thinks. I could go on and on. And then the last one is the appetites, right? God gave us hunger so that we know we should eat. He gives us thirst so that we know we should drink. And, and, he, and he gives us all the things he does for all the different kinds of appetites that bring us comfort and pleasure in life. And those are all gifts from God. But if you take them too far, then you're worshiping them and that becomes your God. And so that's what he's saying here is that don't go there. Don't be deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures that will derail you from your walk with God. We lived in malice and in envy, being hated and hating one another, but when the kindness of God and the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us. This is why we call him Savior, because he's a Savior. He saves us. He's a rescuer. He's a deliverer. He's a freedom fighter, the ultimate freedom He saved us. Now, here's, here's the reason. He didn't save us because of the righteous things you and I have done. That's back to the good works. We don't do those things to earn that favor. Not because, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. So what is mercy? Let me uh, jot this down real quick. So um, a lot of times we get these three confused. Justice, grace, and mercy. Okay? So justice is getting what you deserve. Okay? Grace is getting what you don't deserve. And mercy is not getting what you do deserve. All right, let's unpack it real quick. Sorry for my writing. Okay, so justice, so imagine, um, okay, so I'll tell you a story. This is not a flattering story, but I'll tell you anyway. Um, So I'm I'm in St. Stephen's, the great metropolis of St. Stephen's, South Carolina, up near Lake Marion, 
and I just had lunch with somebody from our church. This is years ago, and um, I'm heading back on that beautiful five-lane highway in the middle of nowhere with no cars on it with a speed limit of 35 miles an hour. I'm not justifying it. I'm just saying I might have been going a little faster than 35 when the cop pulled me. It is a speed trap. Everybody knows it. If you don't know it, thank you, and you're welcome. Okay, so um, I'm driving. I get pulled. I get the ticket, and it's like a 200, over $200 fine, okay? And honestly, I know, okay, I'm not sure he really clocked me at that. Now, in the back of my mind, I'm also thinking, I totally deserve a ticket. I'm way overdue for a ticket. So I'm really not that upset. I'm just upset that it's so much money. And so I decide I'm going to go back to the court here. You know, they let you come to court and stand before the judge. And, and I'm going for one reason, to plead for mercy. I am not going up there to argue the ticket, okay? So justice is I get the ticket and I pay the fine. That's justice, right? Getting what I deserve, <laughs> all right? But not getting the ticket would be what I would want. I don't, I, I don't want to get what I deserve. I don't want what I get what I deserve, okay? And so I, I go, and I stand before the judge, and, I, and he's like, you know, it, it's really funny. He's seen 100,000 people come through his courtroom for the exact same reason, Okay? If you've been in Charleston for any length of time, you probably have a ticket from St. Stephen's. Okay? And he's seen everybody. He knows everybody. And so you know, he's just, and he's like, he doesn't even ask me any questions. He's like, you want a reduction in the fine? I'm like, yeah, yes, sir. <laughs> he's like, well, you drove all the way up here from Somerville. I'll give you 20 bucks for gas. <laughs> okay? That's, I'm serious. He said that. <laughs> for gas. And gas was really high at the time in his defense. Okay? So, um, that, but that was mercy. It wasn't much mercy, but it was mercy. He didn't have to do that. I didn't deserve that. I deserved to pay the whole fine. And he could have been justified in piling on more for me, you know, coming in his courtroom or whatever. And then grace would have been, it didn't happen, but grace would have been, you're guilty, you're paying the full fine. And then he would have taken his robes off, come around and paid for my ticket for me, my fee. That would have been grace. Yeah, that didn't happen. Okay, so those, but it's important that you understand these three, right? Now, listen, it says here that he didn't save us because of the righteous acts that we had done. In other words, we would have been able to say, ah, he saved me because I deserve it. Nope. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve mercy any more than I did. Okay, but he gave us mercy anyway. The difference is it wasn't a traffic fine. My sin was so ridiculously offensive to my creator that he sent his own son to die for it. My sin, mine alone, forget you guys, whew, you know, mine alone was so wretched in his eyes that it cost Jesus his life. And that's the fine. That's the only fine that pays the price. There's nothing I could bring to the table that would approach paying for that fine. And God took off the robes of justice and after he executed justice and he came around and he paid my fine. So that's why we have, at the cross, we have all three of these. We have the justice of God punishing sin but giving mercy to sinners by grace through faith. Isn't that cool? Isn't that cool? It's like we've always used grace and mercy interchangeably. They're close. They're both under the umbrella of love but they're nuanced and different, okay? So, um, so let's keep going now. So he's, he's, he tells us God's motive, but because of his mercy. He saved us, now he's gonna tell us how he saved us, okay? So put on your, your seminary hat, time for a little theology. Okay, here we go. He saved us through what? Some Bibles are gonna say regeneration, which is good. That's a real good translation. Um, NIV is gonna break it into two or more words here, and he's gonna say, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that, and that's why, and I'll talk to you about that in a second. So let's, let's break this down, okay? Now, what I want to do here is explain. Some of you have heard me do this, but I want you to see it here because I think um, sometimes we teach things and we don't show you where they come from in Scripture. And, it, and it's not all in this passage, but it gives me an excuse to talk about these three things. So let's talk about it like this. Okay, and so this is going to be justification. 
okay? And that's what he just said there, right? He said, um, he, through the washing of rebirth and renew, okay, verse, I lost it. There, there it is. Uh, verse seven, have, oh, okay, I haven't gotten there yet. So that, here's the why, having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. Okay, rebirth and renewal are gonna come in here though, okay? So let me, let me start with this. Salvation is a work of God. Without God, there's no salvation. There's no such thing. God initiates salvation, okay? I don't go looking for God and then God goes, oh, you want some of that, okay? No, no, God comes looking for me. I have no clue I want or need it. I just know I'm in pain and suffering because of my lostness. Think back to the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they are full of shame. They now realize they're naked because they've just had the fruit and they've broken the one rule. There's only one rule. You'll have one job, don't break that rule. No, that wasn't their one job. It was be fruitful and multiply, which is way more fun than don't break that one rule. But what did they do? They gave in to the temptation, right? And so they're covered in shame. And what do they do? They run and hide because they feel so exposed because they are now. And what does God do? Does he go looking for them and going, what in the world are you doing? Why did you do that? I can't believe. No, no, no. He goes to look for them so that he can restore them. He initiates the restoration process, which ends up being a sacrifice of some creature that generates clothing for them so that they can cover themselves. And they begin to realize, even though they're put out of the garden, he loves me, even though. He loves me just as if I'd never sinned. Justified, just as if I'd never sinned. Now, this, that's true whether you know English or not, okay? That was true before the English language existed, okay? It's just another way to remember, just as if I'd never sinned, even though I sinned. God loves you and me, okay? And he reaches out, he initiates the process. And what he makes us, what Paul goes to the trouble to say here is that one of the works of the Holy Spirit is that he regenerates you. He does it through rebirth, which is instantaneous, and he does it through renewal, which is all time. And that's where this is going to go, okay? This is rebirth, justification, which means, by the way, declared righteous. Declared righteous, or you could just say right, and declared righteous in what way? Your relationship with God. You're declared right with God. Okay? Some of y'all can't see this, can you? All right? Um, So that's rebirth. But then renewal happens over time. Okay? And this, this one is called sanctification. Okay? This is, okay, this one's past. This one's present. And this one's future. Okay, have you ever read in scripture where Paul says, you have been saved? How many of you remember? Paul says, you've been saved. Anybody ever read that? He's writing to Christians, right? Everything in the New Testament is written to Christians. I mean, it's, the context is always he's writing to believers. Have you ever read in the New Testament where he says you are being saved? Anybody remember that? Recall that and go and scratch your head going, what? I thought I was saved. I thought they were saved. You're being saved. Have you ever read in scripture where it says you're going to be saved? And he's talking to Christians. That's really confusing, right? It's like, okay, help me out. Okay, I'm going to help you out. Okay. And he does it a little bit here with rebirth and renewal because that's justification. That happened in the past if you're a Christian. Present sanctification. This is the process of becoming who God says you are. Okay, I'll give you an example. In many of the letters of Paul, he says, he calls them, he's talking to believers, he's writing to believers, he says, you're saints, he calls them saints. How many of you feel like a saint today? No hands. For the record, there are no hands up in the room but mine, and mine's just hypothetical, it's not true. Actually, I don't feel like a saint, but I am, and so are you in Christ. Positionally, you have been justified because you've been declared righteous, that makes you a saint, which simply means holy one. 
Otherwise, you've got no hope for heaven, folks. You better be holy because that's all that's allowed in, ho- in heaven. But you're like, but I don't feel holy. And I know what it was. I know how the car ride to church went today. You're like, I get that, right? That's why this matters. Okay? So I've talked to you about this before. There's a gap between what's true positionally with my relationship with God and what's true in my life and how I'm carrying it out. There's a gap between where I should be and where I am and how I'm living out my faith. Some days I'm closer to that and some days I'm further, but hopefully there's a trajectory and it's up and to the right. I'm getting closer and closer to being more and more like Jesus. But let's face it, zero days has Darren ever been like Jesus all day long. It just doesn't happen even though I strive for it and walk by faith to seek it right? Not there yet. You know, maybe by the time he takes me home and glorifies me because then I won't have to deal with sin. No presence, no power, no penalty of sin anymore. Okay. So sanctification is that process. When we talk about discipleship, this is the process we're talking about. We're talking about what are the things you need to put into your life to incorporate in your life? What rhythms, what habits, what spiritual uh, disciplines, what practices do you need to have incorporated in your life? What things do you need to remove from your life so that you get this up and to the right? And you've seen us talk about this before. This is our bullseye. And up and to the right leads us to fruitfulness in how we live because this is Christ-like character and this is Christ-like competency or skill, okay? Be and do like Christ. Be good, do good. You see it? Be do good. We are saved to be good and to do good by the power of God through the Holy Spirit, by grace, through faith. He has saved us, he is saving us, and he is going to save us. In other words, I've started it and I'm going to finish what I start. That's why the Holy Spirit's called a deposit. Ephesians, 1 Corinthians, the the Holy Spirit is a deposit that lives in you, guaranteeing that he's going to finish what he started. Like when you sign those papers and you buy a house, (laughs) you don't own that house, you buy a house and then the bank owns it, right? And you have all these papers you've signed and you are guaranteeing that your your, your little down payment's going to blossom into paying that house off, right? Well, the difference is he 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 won't default on his loan. He is 100% guaranteeing he's going to finish in you what he started. That's good news. That should cause you to stand up and shout. You don't have to, but I'm just saying. You know what I'm saying? It should cause you to go, yes, I don't have to wonder. You talk to a, uh, I, t- I remember talking to a Hindu guy in the office back when I was engineering, and uh, I was trying to help this guy understand. I, I kept saying, so dude, do you, do you sin? He goes, yeah, I sin. I said, do you? I don't know if I said dude, okay. I was trying to be respectful. Um, and he's a fellow engineer, and I was like, well, how do you get forgiveness? He had trouble with that, but he gave me an answer. I said, how do you know when you're forgiven? He couldn't answer that. He doesn't know. Ask a Muslim, when are you forgiven? Right? When have you done enough to earn your way into, ask any religion, how do you know when you're forgiven? And there's just no, well, he's just agreeing with me. He's good. You know what I'm saying? Right? So, well, we been saved, we're being saved, and one day he's going to finish what he's starting. He's going to take us home, right? Right, some, some of you are closer to this than others, right? Some of us are close to it and don't know it yet, okay? What do you want, him said, what do you want to be said at your funeral? What do you want him to say? Is your life on a trajectory that gets you there? I said another way, what do you want your grandkids to say about you at your funeral? Whoa, that's new territory for me. But it's a good thing to think about. All right, so um, let's let's land this plane. All right, so uh, he saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal. Rebirth, this is, you know, born again, born from above, John 3. Renewal all over the New Testament. By the Holy Spirit, he's the one who does the work. God, three in one, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, who he poured out on us generously because God's not a skimpy God. He's a generous God who through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, it's all by grace, we become, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life, okay? 
that's, those are words that we struggle, they, it's like Teflon, it hits our brain and slides off. Hope, eternal life. But in our gut, we know we need hope. In our gut, we're going, I need something to hang on to because things are really hard right now, okay? What is our hope? Our hope is that this isn't all there is. If this is as good as it gets, oh my goodness, no wonder people are depressed. This would lead you to despair. This isn't it, folks. This is not it. It gets so much better and forever. Can you imagine a day? Think of the best day you've ever had. You know, kids will do that. So, man, this is the best day ever. And you went to Disney World and you're like, we spent four hours standing in line. Best day ever, you know. But, but think about it. Everybody has best days, right? Imagine that every day from that day forward is better than the one before. Every, for eternity. I can't imagine. I mean, that just blows me away. And I, that's starting here on earth. When you get to heaven, the first day is, is infinitely better than your best day here. The, the worst day in heaven is infinitely better than the best day here. And it only gets better. Okay? Because God is infinite. There is no limit. All right. Um, so then he says this. So air means, by the way, because um, we have, air means not hair. It means air as in, in air inheritance, okay? Somebody has to die for you to get an inheritance. You realize that, okay? You're in the will. Jesus died so that you could be a joint heir with him. That means he died and gets the inheritance because he's not dead anymore, by the way. That's just then, right? And he says in Hebrews, and I don't mind you being my brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm going to share the wealth. Why? Because he's got so much he can afford to, right? I'll take the crumbs of Jesus, but he's not just giving me crumbs. He's giving me the brother's share, sister's share of the inheritance of abundant life forever, okay? This is a trustworthy saying. In case you didn't trust Paul, he's just gonna say it. You can trust me on this. And then he says to Titus, and I want you to stress these things, okay? I think I've stressed these things. I, I, it's not just once, though. So that, here's why. So that, now don't miss this. This is really the point. And we've made this point multiple times, so say it with me at the proper time. So that those who have, I'm in verse... Eight. I want you to stress these things. Why? So that those who have trusted in God, a lot of people that are here, may be careful to do what? To devote themselves to what? To doing what is good. Good doctrine leads to good behavior because it's from a good faith. words. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. Don't you love it? Excellent and profitable for everyone. Most excellent. Okay? Saved to be good and to do good. Okay? Get them in the right order and, and ask yourself the question, am I on a trajectory that's going to get me to a place where I feel like people will be so, it'll be so clear from the way that I lived what good looks like that they'll praise God for you and not praise you because that's what you gotta do at the end, you know, right? How many funerals have been to where they're like, yep, they just said all the possible good things you could have said about that person and we're already done, right? Because you know what they're like. Unless Jesus comes back, we're all going to end up in a funeral service. Okay? First of all, don't be bummed by that if you know the Lord. <laughs> that means the best is yet to come, and it starts to come. That's good news. Yes, there's going to be grieving on this side because we're going to miss you because we get so focused in the here and now, we forget about eternal, eternal hope. Living light of eternity changes that perspective, but we do get, I mean, that's a, that's a tough moment to lose somebody physically close to you. You've been married for 40 years. That's, that's tough, okay? And yet, right, if you're both in Christ, it's just temporary. It's hard, but it's temporary, okay? 
So my question is, is your life built around the good one? Grace has a face. His name is Jesus. When we embrace that grace, our face becomes the face of grace. We get to live it out in his place. Gosh, that's way too much rhyming. Okay, all right, you with me? Okay, so we're going we're gonna to sing, and we're going to take the Lord's Supper. Now, we do this every week because we want to remember that grace is free, but it is not cheap, and we shouldn't cheapen it. Chris talked about that last week. We need to make sure that we are sobered by what it cost us. And so we take a piece of bread and a cup of juice to remember that Jesus died. He was abused and died. He was tortured and died for our sins so that we could live for him. He died for us in our place so that we could live for him. Remember justice, grace, and mercy? We get them all in Jesus. That's why the cross is a symbol that the church reveres and loves and cherishes. And if somebody ever sees your little cross on a chain, they go, why do you wear that? You can say, grace, justice, mercy. It, it's all there. It's awesome. Let me tell you about it. Okay? If you're going to wear cross jewelry, use it. Okay? If you don't know the Lord Jesus, then you don't know the forgiveness that you can receive, the hope that you can have. And that's, I, I, I want more for you than that. I want you to know freedom. I want you to know hope. I want you to know we're all going to spend eternity somewhere. Okay? I would pray that it would be in the presence of the one who created you. He created you because he wanted to know you and you to know him. Okay? And he made the way clear through written word and through the living word, Jesus himself. And we can read about him in history. Most of that history is right here. And so my prayer is that you would understand that it is by, it's just stepping forward in faith towards him and saying, I trust you, God. I don't understand it all, but I know that my way has been to nowhere. And at the end of my rope, when I'm in that box, I want people to see a life that was so changed by God that they can't help but praise God because of the life that person lived. Imperfectly, yes. Inconsistently, of course. And yet, God's grace and mercy was evident. Let's pray. Lord God, I, I am so grateful that you saved a wretch like me. I'm so grateful. So undeserved. The only thing I deserve is your justice, and that is the holy wrath of God, my creator. And yet, because you're not just holy, because you're also love, you made a way that cost you dearly for me to be freed from, the, from being enslaved to sin and death, shame and guilt, and hell itself. Thank you for setting me free. Lord, even now, many of us have things on our hearts and minds that we're being convicted of. Your spirit is tapping us on the shoulder and saying, this area of your life is keeping you from becoming more like Jesus. Give us the courage and the humility and the faith to believe that by forsaking that nonsense, we can embrace your grace. We can receive your grace and be changed through and through by it. God, I pray the room would be full of humility, that we would shelve our pride as obsolete, that we would remember that ultimately we are citizens of a, of a kingdom that will never end where the king is totally just and holy and righteous and good. And that we would live as citizens of that kingdom above all else. In Jesus' name.